dear students today in this module we will be discussing about e-waste now what are e-waste e-waste are nothing but electronic waste or waste electrical and electronic equipment now it is a type of solid waste and they require special care or attention in terms of its management because they create a lot of environmental and health hazards. Now the e-waste generation has been increasing with time because many people have started using computers, mobiles, refrigerators. Now every individual house has all these electronic items. Now examples of electronic waste are the electronic gadgets, mobiles, personal computers, then your refrigerators and so on. Now e-waste contains a lot of heavy metals like gold, lead, silver, copper which can be recovered and reused. So a separate industry works on e-waste management to recover these metals. Now we'll look into further details in the upcoming slides. Now with this introduction, now let's discuss about the learning objectives of this module. The learning objectives of this module would be to understand what is e-waste, what are its sources of generation, the challenges that we face in e-waste generation and management both in developing and developed countries. Then we will discuss about the classification of e-waste and e-waste management aspect with special emphasis on e-waste management in India. We will also discuss about various steps that are involved in e-waste management. Now, as I told you earlier, e-waste is nothing but electronic waste or waste electrical and electronic equipment. It is also called as end of life electronics. They are electronic devices which are no longer of any use to the owner. Now examples, again I have, to, I have mentioned earlier, refrigerators, air conditioners, cell phones, personal systems consumer electronics and so on. Now e-waste in India are categorized into two groups based on their usage as one information technology and telecommunication equipment two consumer electrical and electronic goods. Now information technology and telecommunication it's very clear all your mobile phones comes under this uh, mobile phones computers laptops all these things comes under information technology and telecommunication equipment. Consumer electrical and electronics includes your refrigerators, televisions and motherboards which are associated with these electronic goods. Now in general e-waste is divided into five groups based on the material that is used. One ferrous metals, non-ferrous metals, glass, plastic and others. If you see the composition of the electronic waste, iron and steel occupies a major proportion of 48% followed by plastic which contributes to 21% of your weight and then followed by your non-ferrous metals. Now this also includes precious metals. Now this contributes to total 13% of weight and out of the 13%, 7% is occupied by copper. Now this figure shows what the typical material fractions in a waste electrical and electronic equipment. Now as I told you earlier, this uh, composition is given in terms of weight, iron and steel occupies maximum 47.9% followed by plastic 15.3%, copper 7%, glass 5.4%, flame retarded plastic is 5.3%, aluminium 4.7%, the printed circuit boards 3.1% and others 4.6%, wood plywood is around 2.6%, concrete and ceramics about 2%, and other metals like non-ferrous metals occupy one. The least amount is occupied by rubber which contributes to 0.9% by composition in the waste electrical and electronic equipment. Now if you look into the environmental concerns that is related to e-waste management or why is e-waste management is essential? Because uh, uh, in the introduction I told you they contribute or they create a lot of health and environmental hazard. For example, if you see e-waste contains a lot of metals as I told you earlier like it contains lead, gold, cadmium, boron, beryllium, so on. Lead is used in circuit boards and 
CRTs. CRTs are nothing but cathode ray tubes. Then cadmium is used in contacts and switches. Bromated flame retardants are used in plastics. Now these heavy metals when D disposed of without any treatment, they slowly enter into the soil and through soil it also enters uh, into the food chain and affects the health of an individual. Even animals health are also affected. Now air pollution aspect as such if you see, when you burn this waste, they generate um, a lot of gases which might lead to air pollution. It also results in the acidification of soil because uh, these uh, e-waste contains acids and heavy metals along with other substances which when mixes with water it increases or it releases acids which when enters into the soil matrix it acidifies the medium and increases the acid content of the soil. Now this table explains in detail what are the different health effects that are caused by the e-waste toxins. For example, the printed circuit boards which contains lead and cadmium affects the nervous system, kidney and liver. Motherboards which contain beryllium, it affects your lungs and skin. Cathode ray tubes which contains lead oxide, barium and cadmium, it affects your heart, liver and other muscles. Switches and flat screen monitors uh, uh, contains mercury, it affects your brain and skin. Computer batteries which contain cadmium, again it affects your liver and kidney. Capacitors and transformers which contain PCBs, the polychlorinated biphenyls, they affect your overall immune system. Printed circuit boards, plastics which contain brominated flame retardant, again it affects your nervous system and uh, the overall immune of your body. The cable insulation and coating which contains polyvinyl chloride, again effect, it affects your immune system. Now the plastic housing which contains bromine, it affects the endocrine system, the endocrine glands in your body. Now this table summarizes the top 10 states where e-waste generation is very high. So among this Maharashtra tops followed by Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Delhi, Karnataka, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh and Punjab. Now let's discuss about the challenges that are associated with e-waste management. Irrespective whether it is a developed country or underdeveloped country or developing countries, commonly there are certain challenges. Now as you see, these e-waste contains around 60% of recyclables. So generally they facilitate trade between developed and developing countries. That means the developed countries send their waste to developing countries and developing countries generate revenue by collecting this 60% of recyclables from the e-waste. Now since they contain a lot of toxic and valuable metals, it is difficult for, uh, to manage e-waste. Now in developing countries, the cost of repair of these electronic items are very high when compared to the cost of actual electronic item. So what people do is, rather than spending so much in repairing an item, they go and purchase a new one. So as a result, the e-waste generation increases. Then here recycling is also expensive. Then the land availability in landfills are very less. So as a result, the e-waste management plan, plan encourages to, for you to find out alternate methods for management. Again, this is one important or major challenge. Now, improper methods of dismantling the electronic items by unskilled workers are also a major challenge which we face in recent times. Generally, what do people do is like these unskilled workers, like uh, uh, if you see uneducated people or unskilled workers for dismantling these electronic items and recover these metals. This results in the occupational hazard as well as improper dismantling where the quality of the material is also lost. That is again a big challenge. Lack of proper regulation also becomes a great challenge for the e-waste management. Now let's specifically discuss about the challenges that a developed countries face in e-waste management. Now here the increasing quantity of e-waste in developed countries is like uh, as I told you earlier, the cost of repair is very high and the cost of equipment is very low. So rather than repairing it, people tend to buy a new one. 
So this keeps on adding e-waste in the developed countries. Second, uh, if you see the quantity of e-waste generated ends up in landfills because it is not being repaired. Then the regulations were framed by local government bodies to manage e-waste due to decreased availability of landfill space and increased recognition of the toxic nature of e-waste. Now this is again a challenge which we already discussed earlier. Here the developed countries frame regulations to uh, find out new or alternate methods because there is less availability of land in landfill space. Also these e-waste contains a lot of toxic materials so you need certain alternative methods for its safe disposal. Now the regulations uh, has made it expensive to recycle e-waste also. So that is again another challenge due to which e-waste gets accumulated. So all these points necessitate the formulation or framing out of new alternate technology so that e-waste management can be cheaper and more efficient. Now what are the challenges that a developing countries face? Uh, when you talk about developing countries, the increasing quantity of e-waste is not only due to economic growth but also uh, the challenge or related change in consumer behavior. Now e-waste is considered as a resource for income generation instead of waste owing to its availability of large scale unskilled labor. Since you have these developing countries uh, uh, have a lot of population who are unskilled as well as unemployed. So they involve these people in uh, dismantling or segregation or resource recovery from the e-waste. Again, mostly informal sector or unskilled persons are involved in dismantling and resource recovery. So this is again becomes a, a bigger challenge in e-waste management in developing countries. They use unsound environmental practices. Again, that leads to that becomes a challenge in developing countries. Also, lack of proper regulation leads to this challenge. Now, let's discuss about the sources of e-waste. Now, from where the e-waste are actually generated? Electrical and electronic equipment include a large gamut of products, starting from your small household equipment to large household equipment, uh, small household equ equipments like toys, and large household equipments like refrigerators, washing machines, then mobiles. Then comes your IT sector where office equipments are generated, disks, CDs, uh, floppies, pen drives, broken hard disks, CPUs, monitors and so on. Then the fourth one is your hospital sector where your medical equipments are generated. And the last one is institutional sector, again institutes like universities, schools, colleges where computers, laptops, floppies, pen drives, hard disks are generated. Sources of e-waste generation are very large and it ranges from individual users to households to organizations. Now let's discuss about the classification of e-waste. There is no specific or a generic system of classification of e-waste and it varies from country to country. The United Nations University classification also known as UNU keys classifies e-waste based on certain categories. One, based on products of similar function. Two, comparable material composition, that is in terms of hazardous substance and valuable materials. Third, average weight, end of life characteristics, lifespan distribution. According to this, it has almost 54 categories of e-waste that are grouped under 10 primary categories. Now this table, provides you how e-waste is categorized in India. According to Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, they have categorized e-waste into two groups. One, information technology and telecommunication equipment and two, consumer electrical and electronic items. Now under information technology, centralized data processing, mainframes, mini computers, personal computers including your CPU, laptops, notebook, notepad, printers, including your cartridges, copying equipment, electrical and electronic typewriters, telex, telephones, all come under information technology and telecommunication equipment. 
Now, as I told you earlier, consumer electrical and electronic goods include your television sets, including your LCD, LED, refrigerators, washing machines, air conditioners, and centralized air conditioning plants. Dear students, welcome back. In the first part, we discussed about what is e-waste. Now, what are the different sources from e-waste is generated? Then we discussed about the classification, where the UNU, how it is classifying e-waste, and in India, how e-waste is categorized into two main categories, like information technology and consumer electrical and electronic goods. Now, in the second part, we will discuss about the management of e-waste. Now, e-waste management is based on the principle of extended producer responsibility. In short, you call it as EPR. Now, EPR is defined as an environmental protection strategy that makes a manufacturer of the, of the product responsible for the entire life cycle of the product and especially for the take back, recycling and final disposal of the product. So, according if a company is having an EPR, for example, let's take any company for that matter, uh, if you're buying a laptop, that company, like for example, if you're buying a Dell laptop, now the Dell company is responsible till the life cycle of the product. They should take back, recycle and they will be in charge till the final disposal of the product. That is EPR. Now, there are five parameters that are, that are to be considered while designing an EPR based on e-waste management system. Now, they include legal regulation, system coverage, system financing, producer responsibility and compliance. These are the five parameters which you have to look into while designing your EPR. Now, these above mentioned parameters are closely interlinked and they play a very important role in a proper management of these waste, electrical and electronic equipments. The linking of the manufacturing phase of the product with its disposal by the EPR generally encourages the manufacturer to go for better product design and also enable easy upgrading and recycling. So, by doing so, uh, the life of the product is increased and also the e-waste generation will be minimized. The Swiss RD where the return, taking back and disposal of electrical and electronic equipment promotes collection, recycling of e-waste and it also restricts the use of certain hazardous substances in your electrical and electronic equipment. Many countries in Asia like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan also have their own national regulations to tackle the challenges of e-waste. In developing countries, lack of regulation is a very serious problem which we have already discussed in the challenges of e-waste. Now, many developing countries like China and India have recently implemented e-waste legislation in line with the European Union Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive in short, it is abbreviated as EUWEEE. Now, generally in developing countries, there's a big problem. What do they do is they involve a lot of unskilled workers for recovering resource from this e-waste. Now, when they recover uh, or by dismantling the e-waste, they are exposed to a lot of health hazards. Generally, they are considered as uh, environmentally unsound practice because the segregation or dismantling generally occurs in the backyard and they do not follow proper procedures. These informal sector generally generate a lot of revenue and they, that becomes a source of living for these unskilled workers. Again, this we have already discussed as one of the major challenges of the developing countries. Now, let us discuss about the major components of e-waste management. One is e-waste collection, sorting and disposal, the other one is e-waste recycling. Now again, just like uh, municipal solid waste or any other solid waste, e-waste also has a waste management steps which involves collection, sorting where it is segregated and treated before disposal. And recycling, it becomes a part of a waste processing or treatment step. In industries, e-waste is managed using the principle of waste minimization. Now, there are various steps that are involved in waste minimization. One is inventory management, second is your production or process modification, third volume reduction and fourth recovery and reuse. 
Now waste minimization generally talks about uh, modifications in your process or any particular step where you can minimize the waste by either replacing with any alternative method that can reduce the waste minimization or you can use any other less hazardous substance like that is spoken up in your production or process modification. Then you can reduce the volume of uh, waste generation by adopting alternate methods and whatever waste that is generated you can recover or reuse. This is the principle of waste minimization even that can be applied to e-waste and generally as I told you earlier industries use this waste minimization plan. Now let us discuss about e-waste treatment. E-waste is a mixture of valuable materials as well as toxic substances. Now valuable materials should be recovered and recycled and toxic materials should be treated before disposal. Now e-waste generally requires a labor intensive manual segregation along with capital intensive technical process for the separation of toxic waste. Now handling e-waste by manual dismantling has been suggested as a best starting process for e-waste treatment. Now the dismantled e-waste will then be separated into glass, copper, steel, aluminium, plastic and other printed circuit boards. The total content of printed circuit board in e-waste is generally 3 to 5 percent of weight while metals, plastic and glass constitute 95 to 97 percent. Now the hazardous co components like the capacitors, CRT screens, CFC gases, light bulbs, batteries are generally separated and removed at this particular stage. Then they are mechanically processed which is a large scale operation and it enables increase of recyclable materials in a dedicated fraction. It also helps to further separate hazardous materials. Now the typical components of a mechanical processing units include your crushing units, shredders, magnetic eddy current separator and air separators. Now what happens is the material that comes in are crushed using certain shredders or crushing units. Uh, shredders will reduce the size into small and crushing units will generally reduce the larger item into lesser ones and further shredders are applied to reduce the size further. Now mag magnetic and eddy current separators what do they do is you apply magnetic field and all the ferrous metals are separated in a magnetic separator and in eddy current separator non ferrous metals like aluminum and copper will be separated. Now air separators are used for separation of lighter materials. For example, if you have less uh, weight or less density material, if you use air separators like air classifier, then they can be separated easily. The gas emissions are filtered and the effluents that are, uh, are, are treated to minimize the environmental impact. The final step in e-waste management is e-waste recycling and it is also called as refining. Now here, there are some photographs uh, of the crushers and shredding units. Uh, on the left side you can see uh, a crushing units. The enlarged uh, image is on the right side where if you add them they have a big jaw so that it will crush the item into smaller fractions. In the second image you can see these are magnetic and eddy current separators. You can see a pulley sort of arrangement where the material is uh, coming uh, through a conveyor belt and this pulley will have a magnetic uh, field. It will attach and once it, the pulley turns over all the substance will be separated like your non-metallic will be separated and non-ferrous uh, metals will be separated. Now during the treatment process whatever fractions of waste that are uh, obtained are refined and they are generally sold as a secondary raw material. Now during the refining process attention is paid to metals, glass and plastic. At the end of refining and after extraction of valuable fraction the residue which is usually non-usable and toxic is disposed of and the rest which is usable are either sent as a secondary raw material or it, it is recycled back. Now here I have given a flow chart uh, which shows how a scrap IC board is treated. Now generally the IC board or the integrated circuit boards they are subjected to primary crushers. Once they are crushed into uh, smaller size then they are subjected to magnetic separator 
as I told you earlier magnetic separator it uh, helps in separation of metallic uh, items like for example if you have iron in them when you apply magnet obviously it will stick to it and once you stop the magnetic field you can separate the iron or any other metallic component. Then they are further subjected to hammer mills. Hammer mills are again a sort of um, size reduction units where uh, it, it consists of a drum like item where you have three or four hammers when your uh, waste is subjected the hammers keep hitting at the waste and it will reduce the size further. Now once the size is reduced further you subject it to a cyclone separator. Now cyclone separator is a, a, a device where uh, it separates all the dust materials which are associated or which is released during the process. Now after this once again they are separated to magnetic separator to separate iron and non-ferrous substances. Further once again after this separation they will be subjected to an air classifier where light plastics will be removed. Once again after this air classifier they will be subjected to eddy current separator to separate out aluminium and other uh, non-ferrous metals like copper. Finally they will separate it to electrostatic separator where copper will be removed and whatever that is left out that is the fiberglass or resin will be further disposed of or it can be used as a raw material. Now another example in uh, e-waste uh, treatment or management you can say it is CRT tube recycling. Now CRT as I told you earlier the, these are cathode ray tubes which are generally used in televisions and computer monitors. Now they consist of glass of different composition. The front panel is made of lead free barium strontium glass whereas the inner side or the funnel hidden uh, side consists of glass with lead oxides. Now the glass recovered from uh, CRT can be used in further manufacturing of CRTs like it is called as closed loop recycling where the materials that is recovered from the waste product it is used in the manufacturing of the same product or into other products like open loop recycling. Now recycling of the waste CRTs generally consists of two broad technologies one is your glass to glass and the other one is glass to lead recycling. Now first let us discuss about glass to glass recycling. Now glass to glass recycling as I told you it is a closed loop process where the CRTs that are recovered from the waste are sent to CRT manufacturing to obtain leaded and unleaded glass required for the manufacturing of new CRTs. Now the steps that are involved during this process include one remove the CRT from the plastic casing then release the vacuum in the tube. Third, remove various metals and non-glass metals including the electronic gun. Then separate panel glass from funnel glass and lastly remove the phosphor coating from the panel glass. Now the advantages of a glass to glass recycling is it enables replacement of virgin material with recycled glass at lower cost. Also it improves the quality of output glass. Now there are also disadvantage. The difficulty of identifying glass composition in the waste CRT is little difficult. Also it involves high cost of collection and significant labor. Now the second type is your glass to lead recycling. In glass to lead recycling it involves separating and recovery of metallic lead and copper from waste CRT glass using a smelting process. The recovered CRT glass then goes into lead smelters and acts like a fluxing agent during the smelting process. The process is automated and when compared to glass to glass recycling they are more cost effective. The process also safeguards workers from inhaling lead that is generated during the process. Now let us discuss about the e-waste management in India. Now according to UN report. India is the fifth biggest producer of e-waste in the world discarding around 1.7 million tons of electronic and electrical equipment. The e-waste stream in the country it is increasing at a very faster rate and it is three times faster than the municipal waste stream generation. Government institution, public and private sectors are have been identified as major contributors and they contribute to around 70% of the total amount. Now, now e-waste management in India has been 
largely left to highly organized informal sector which generally performs the collection, segregation and dismantling and final recycling process. The informal sector as I told you earlier they are generally engaged in waste recycling co uh, companies and they generally comprise of uh, urban poor and rural migrants. They handle or recycle nearly 95% of the total waste that is recycled. The recycling of this informal sector is done in a primitive way in the backyard of businesses and hence they are exposed to more health hazards. Also uh, improper or unsound environmental practices generally damages the environment and also leads to a lot of loss of valuable material due to unsound dismantling practices. Now there are reports on environmental and to toxicological impacts of improper treatment of e-waste but when you talk about impact on recycling workers who handle or dismantle the waste it is not available. Now the since the informal recycling happens in slums and outskirts most mostly the workers who are involved are children and they generally get affected to respiratory problems. Delhi is one example which is considered or recognized as a major hub for informal recycling in the country. The informal sector in Delhi alone employs around 25,000 people in this sector. Now let us discuss about the e-waste regulation in India. E-waste is regarded as a hazardous waste mostly due to the presence of hazardous substances in them because they cause serious environmental and health effects. So to avoid these environmental effects and health effects you have to manage them properly. Although a sub separate rule has been framed to manage hazardous waste in India, still a separate rule was enacted in 2012 called as e-waste management and handling rules 2011 due to its unique nature. These rules have further been amended taking into consideration the existing e-waste management plan and they have uh, been re-enacted as e-waste management rules 2016 which came into force in October 2016. Now let us see what are the salient features of this um, e-waste management rule. Now it is based on the principle of EPR where the producer of the equipment has been mandated to channelize the e-waste generated after the use of their equipment and manage them in an environmentally sound manner. The producer can do this by implementing a take back system or a setting or setting up of collection centers for or both by having agreed agreements with authorized dismantler or recycler. They could do either individually or collectively through a producer responsibility organization. I mean uh, Dell for example if you take Dell can do it separately or Dell two three companies together they can have a collective effort which is called as producer responsibility organization. Now it recognizes and defines each of the stakeholder who, who are involved with production of electronic equipment and management of the waste generated at the end of its useful life namely the producer, manufacturer, manufacturer, consumer, bulk consumer, collection centers, dealers, e-tailers, refurbisher, dismantler and recycler. The responsibility of each of the stakeholders are explicitly given in the rules. Specific targets have also been set especially for the producers with an expectation of managing around 30% of waste that is generated during the first two years of implementation of the rule. The target will, uh, will increase gradually so that by the seventh year the implementation of the rule should achieve nearly 70% of e-waste generated in the country. Now the penalty uh, of uh, non-compliance of meeting the target includes cancellation of EPR authorization which would result in the producer not being able to put, put products in the market until EPR authorization is re-granted. Apart from having a planned system for managing e-waste, the producers are also required to reduce the amount of hazardous substance in their equipment. The equipment should not contain lead, mercury, chromium and PCBs beyond a certain concentration value of 0.1% by weight and cadmium should be not 
above 0.01 percent in any homogeneous material. To summarize, at the end of this module, we have defined what is e-waste, then we looked into various challenges that is involved in e-waste management in developed and developing countries, then we discussed about the various sources from where e-waste is generally generated and uh, we saw that it is not, uh, it is a large sector, it starts from individual household as well as institutional generation. Then we saw classification of e-waste where U and U keys have classified e-waste into five broad categories. With, in, with respect to India, MOEFCC in 2016, they have classified e-waste into two broad categories. One is information technology and the other one is consumer electronic goods. Then we discussed about e-waste management. We saw how e-waste should be management prop managed properly. Then we started discussing about e-waste treatment where I gave you two examples, one CRT tubes, how CRT tubes are recycled and another one how an IC scrap board can be processed and segregated accordingly. Then lastly, we discussed about e-waste management in India, how these unorganized or unskilled sectors or the laborers, especially children are involved in dismantling of these electronic goods and by doing so, how the quality of the material is lost and how these valuable materials are lost and what are the different hazards they are exposed to and due to uh, these unsound practices, how the environment is getting contaminated. Then lastly, we discussed about the e-waste management rules and I have also told about certain salient features of this rule where we discussed about the EPR, how a company either individually or collectively should form uh, or follow this EPR and what are the penalties or com uh, if will be that will be provided if they do not comply. And then we also saw how or when these rules were framed. I hope you would have enjoyed this module. Thank you.